It's good to see all of you here this morning. We're going to start off a little differently. Um, I, I have two announcements as we get started. The first announcement is, is if you are interested in taking the trip of a lifetime to Costa Rica to do mission work this summer, um, stay after church today. Um, I promise you that if uh, you're trying to beat Calvin to the Mexican restaurant, we will get you there in time. Okay? So uh, stay right after church, five, ten minutes, quick Costa Rica meeting. The second one is... Um, we're going to have a Vacation Bible School organizational meeting February 21st, which is in two weeks. And uh, what we're going to do is start off with a little VBS song, okay? So I need everybody to stand up, and uh, I need you to get your, get your wings warmed up here. Okay, there you go. I like it. All right, and the song is called Mercy is Falling. <laughs> okay, and it goes... Hang on a second. Okay, it goes like this. Hands up in the air. Let me see your spirit fingers. All right, mercy is falling, is falling, is falling. Mercy is falling like a sweet spring rain. Mercy is falling, is falling all over me. Okay, and we'll do that again. And then we get to the chorus, and the chorus starts out with hey, oh. All right, and you have to be really, really loud. So, hey, Oh, I receive your mercy. Hey, oh, I receive your grace. Hey, oh, and then you get to dance for us. I will dance forevermore. Okay? So we're going to watch Kathy Mormon at the dance part. <laughs> All right, so here we go. It's an easy song. It's a fun song, kids. I hope you all like it. And uh, it's called Mercy is Falling. You guys did a great job, and uh, it's times like this I wish you could be up here with us to see the looks on people's faces while they were coming in while y'all were doing that. It was pretty awesome. So good job, guys. All right, our next song this morning is called My Lighthouse. So let's just keep worship going and uh, keep smiling as we sing to Jesus. Peace in my 
blood pumping good this morning, and it is so great to see you here. We have a very special treat. We have baptism this morning. So I would love for you to have a seat, and uh, let's turn all of our attention uh, to Pastor Calvin in the baptismal area.
Christ as your Savior? Therefore, my brother in Christ, it's my joy and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very delighted with his death. Praise the Lord. All right, let's stand and greet each other, and let's just welcome our friends and family to worship uh, as we celebrate God's goodness together.
is so good, and his love for us is so complete. And uh, we're just going to continue singing and celebrating and worshiping God this morning, thanking him for his love. Father, we celebrate that love this morning. Lord, the pure love that you bless upon us as you wake us up, as you let us rest at night, God, as you walk with us through every day. Lord, as you lead us, as you go behind us to support us, as you walk beside us, God, we thank you for your love. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who took that love to the cross. Lord, who allowed that love to wake him from the dead. 
as he rose from the grave. And Lord, as you did that for us. Now, Father, as we turn our hearts and our focus, Lord, to your word, we thank you for our pastor. And Lord, we pray that as you've blessed him with the message this morning, God, that as you speak through him and speak to him, God, that you would also speak to us. Lord, may our ears hear the message. Lord, may our souls just be saturated by, by your word this morning. And God, help us to leave here different. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your word. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. If you're feeling discouraged and defeated, if you're a bit overwhelmed or maybe even feeling undone, if you're wondering whether or not your future has any hope of victory, then listen, this Bible study is for you. Strongholds are torn down by the Word of God. Fortresses are dismantled by the Word of God. When you place faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ is credited to your spiritual bank account that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I invite you to join me for a lesson in putting on the full armor of God. Our lives are going to be changed, yours and mine, because we're going to learn that we've got the victory in Jesus' name. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all this morning. And uh, Robin wanted me to uh, let you know about this Bible study, and it is in the bulletin. And it is starting Saturday morning, this coming Saturday, February the 13th at 10 o'clock. And uh, also this Saturday morning is our men's breakfast uh, at 7 o'clock. And for the price of $2, you get a delicious high cholesterol bacon and eggs and sausage and biscuits and gravy and, and all that good stuff. And uh, you can't beat it, right? Two bucks starts at 7. We get you out here by 830 and uh, also on this uh, coming Saturday, if you would like to help us, we, we're continuing on a little project we've been working on. If you're interested in helping on that project, please uh, let me know, and I will get you uh, connected with the people who are working that project. Uh, but before we go further, I wanted to uh, pass out these uh, baptism certificates, and this is so cool to see people baptized. You know, we are in the sixth Sunday of 2016. And five of the six Sundays this year, we have baptized people. And so this is really a cool thing, okay? And so this morning, we have Miss Courtney Thwart. And uh, her mom, Danielle, is going to take this on her behalf. She's gone up to Elevate. And so congratulations to Courtney. And uh, God bless you, Danielle. So proud of her. Man, that's, that is awesome. And I love seeing uh, children uh, know the Lord and make that public profession of faith. It's, I wish you could be with me when I'm with them up there, all nervous. And, uh, and uh, so I'm trying to keep them just as calm as they can be. And, uh, and she did great this morning. And uh, thank you, Debbie, for praying for her. And, uh, and thank you, Charlie, for praying for your son, Aaron. And uh, Aaron Rock, his mom's here, dad's here. And uh, let's give him a round of applause for being baptized this morning. And uh, congratulations to you. <clears throat> God bless you. All right, there you go. All right, exciting days here at Hickory Ridge, and uh, we've been very busy working, and I want to thank all who have helped us over the last few days uh, with all the work that we have been done. I want to show you a picture of what we have done, and this is uh, uh, what some of our crew has been working on the last several days, and uh, they've worked and worked and worked. Uh, we had about a dozen, maybe 15 people all together uh, that helped with this project, so I wanted to go ahead and, and publicly thank them. Uh, not only did we, we, did we work on this over the weekend, uh, but we also worked on our picnic shelter, and that is almost finished. As a matter of fact, I want to invite you Easter Sunday morning. Now, I know Easter may sound like a long way away, but it's not. Uh, it's just about, uh, I think, six weeks or five weeks from today is Easter Sunday. And so we are doing a sunrise 7-Eleven service, okay, on Easter Sunday. Uh, sunrise on March 29th is at 7-Eleven. So we will be meeting for a sunrise service under our new shelter uh, on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, we have, last year we had Mary Magdalene. She came. Uh, for our sunrise service. This year, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, coming for our sunrise service. And uh, our very own Kathy Mormon will be sharing uh, the sunrise message with us uh, from the eyes of Mary. And then at the conclusion of uh, that, 
Uh, now, our deacons don't know this, but they're going to find out this on Thursday night, and some of them already know this, but our deacons are going to be serving us breakfast after the 7-Eleven sunrise service, and uh, it's going to be good. I promise you it's going to be good, and, uh, and, and if the deacons don't cook it, maybe their wives will, but it, we're going to have a good time on, on Easter Sunday, and then we have our regular scheduled services at 9 o'clock, and then this service at 1030, and I hope that you will invite some people to come uh, with you. I'm going to be uh, not doing my Minor Prophets message on Easter Sunday. I've got a message that I've been working on for Easter Sunday, and so I'm looking forward to that time. I also want to let you know that uh, if you're interested in attending the Weekend to Remember, uh, that is a marriage conference next weekend, and uh, it is right here in Virginia Beach, and if you'd like to go, uh, you need to hurry up and sign up. There's already over a thousand people uh, that have signed up for this conference, and I encourage you to go ahead. It's, uh, it starts on Friday night, Saturday, and then half the day on Sunday, and so if you're interested in that, if you are military, you get to go free. Uh, if you uh, would like to go and you don't have the resources to go, you let me know. Uh, I have two scholarships that I can give to this conference, and uh, Keith Tully will be there, and he is uh, looking uh, for people from Hickory Ridge to come. And uh, at the conclusion of this weekend to remember, the Wednesday after the weekend to remember, which is a week from this Wednesday night, we are going to be starting the Oneness series, uh, which is for couples. It'll be offered on Wednesday night. And uh, Lori and Mickey Estine, who are in this service, will be conducting that. And I hope that you will come and be part of that. Your kids will be taken care of. Uh, we're doing it at the same time as Awana and youth. And if you are involved in our areas of ministry on Wednesday night, and you cannot take this, okay? In the words of Jesus, don't let your heart be troubled because we will be offering this again uh, after they go through the initial class. So don't feel like you're going to miss out if you can't go on this particular round. Uh, they'll get you on the next round, okay? And so uh, I hope that you'll take advantage of that. But man, there's so many exciting things that are happening. And uh, we stay busy working uh, because we are to work and occupy till Christ comes. And uh, somebody asked me one time, well, why do you guys work so hard around here? Why do you try to do so many things? And this is the reason right here. And uh, this was a picture that was snapped uh, during our Awana program, I think two weeks ago. And uh, I got my, my fat head in there with, these are the, uh, the TNT girls. This is just part of the TNT girl club that we do on Wednesday night. We have over 90 kids that are registered for the Iwana ministry. So if you come here Wednesday night, uh, expect organized mass chaos, okay? Uh, but we have a whole lot of fun here on Wednesday night. We have youth on Wednesday night. Uh, that starts at 6.30 and goes to 8 o'clock. And then we have Awana for kids who are three years old up through fifth grade. And uh, Kelly and Jamie Roman do such a fabulous job with our Awana ministry. And I invite you to bring your kids uh, Wednesday night to be part of that. And if you'd like to be in a small group, we do have a small group or two that meets here. I think there's two. We have a ladies group that's here on Wednesday night. And then uh, Melvin and Debbie Evans have a group that meets here Wednesday night. So I'd encourage you to be part of that. Uh, you will have a blast being in those small groups. And you'll have a blast being connected with what God is doing. And so really neat things are happening. And so we work hard for these kids. And we thank the Lord for them. Now tonight is uh, Super Bowl and uh, that's not the most important thing happening today, but that is something that is happening uh, today. And so there's going to be a Super Bowl party here tonight starting at 6 o'clock. And if you're a young person, the teenagers will be having a Super Bowl party uh, at Pastor Eric's house tonight, also at 6 o'clock. So I invite you to be part of that. So speaking about the Super Bowl, uh, this guy you might recognize, this next slide. Uh, this is Michael Orr. And I don't know if you've seen the movie Blindside, but uh, Michael Orr uh, is the main reason that movie was uh, produced, and, uh, and he is the main subject of The Blind Side, which was an inspirational movie uh, told of his childhood po poverty. And he was adopted by Leanne and Sean uh, Tui, and they raised him and, and nurtured him, and uh, he eventually ended up playing offensive tackle in the NFL. And he has played uh, for a couple different teams. He played for the Baltimore Ravens, and then he was traded to the Tennessee Titans, and uh, he had a rough last year with the Titans. And uh, what most people don't realize is that he was pr playing uh, with a broken toe and, uh, and also a, a torn bicep. And so he uh, didn't do great his last season with the Titans, and so they ended up cutting him. Uh, but while he was with the Ravens, he played with Cam Newton's brother. And so tonight, you're going to see Michael Orr defending Cam Newton as they take on the team that hope loses this evening, okay? 
Now, the reason I want them to lose is because they knocked my team out of the championship. And so uh, I am not, you know, I, I know that uh, a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but uh, I, I'm not really too concerned if Manning goes out with a Super Bowl ring or not, okay? Uh, I, I am much more concerned with the Carolina Panthers winning, okay? And so uh, that's who I'll be sharing with tonight. I don't really have a dog in a fight, but I will be uh, sharing for uh, the Panthers this evening. But as you look at this and you think about the story uh, of Michael Orr, fascinating story. Uh, he retired from the NFL. But because of Cam Newton's brother playing with him when he was with the uh, Baltimore Ravens, Cam Newton's brother said, you know who you need to get to defend you? You need somebody who's strong and somebody who will give his life to defend you. He says, you need to get Michael Orr. And so he texted Michael Orr and he says, I want you on my team. So the Panthers signed Michael Orr to a two-year contract, got a little flack for doing that. But he's, uh, he's had a great season this year. And so tonight, Michael Orr will be defending Cam Newton against that dastardly team, the Broncos. Okay? So it's going to be a good game, and I hope that you come. And you say, well, why do you talk about all this? What does this have to do with anything of what we are talking about? It has a lot to do with it because we're talking this morning about Amos. And when you think about the story of Amos, we're going through the Minor Prophets. This is our third message. And as you go through the Minor Prophets, they are major messages taken from shorter books within the Bible. It's not that the message is minor, it's just that the message is short. And so as you think about this, because Michael Orr stood up and was willing to sacrifice himself to defend the quarterback... I think there's a parallel between what God is calling us to do. God is scouring up and down the earth, and he's looking for men and women who will, will, are willing to stand in the gap. Now, now when you stand in the, ba- the gap for God, you're going to take some hits. You will get hit, and you'll get hit hard as you defend the gospel. You may not know a whole lot about the prophet Amos. As a matter of fact, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about Amos, but this is what comes to my mind when I think about Amos, right? <laughs> and it was funny, in the earlier services I put this slide up, I asked that question, and Rob Dempe Wolf answered that question. He says, I think about famous Amos, and I do too. I think about the, uh, the larger size bag of fam- famous Amos chocolate chip cookies where I, I eat at least one bag a week. As you can tell by looking at me, I probably need to cut back on eating famous Amos chocolate chip cookies. But I've gotten to a point in my life where I can't eat much of anything except groceries. And so it's been a difficult travel for me giving up chocolate chip cookies. And so as you think about Amos, I hope that you're not thinking about famous Amos, all right? I hope that you think about this minor prophet whose name means one who carries a burden. Amos is carrying a burden for his people. I really debated whether or not I wanted to do a series going through the Minor Prophets because I'll be honest with you, when you read the Minor Prophets, it's a bunch of doom and gloom and destruction and judgment. I mean, it's really not a happy type of a series of of messages to go through, but it hits us in reality. And as we begin looking at this book of Amos, there's a lot to cover in a short amount of time. But Amos uses a phrase eight times within the first two chapters. And the phrase is this, for three sins or even four will God restrain his judgment. And we see this going on throughout the first two chapters. And so Amos, as he's using this expression, the reason that he is using this expression is because as he confronts his people in the surrounding areas of where he lived, He discovers that God is about to lose his patience. And so he uses this phrase, that fullness, representing the three, the fullness of your sin. You're right at the top. You're about to go over the top of God's patience with you. You're right at the brim is what God is saying. And when you get to that fourth sin, that fourth repeat, you have overflowed, right? Which would be just the opposite of the blessings that God gives us, right? When God blesses us, 
They overflow. But, but Amos is looking at his people and he says, we don't have a problem that we're overflowing with God's blessings because we are being obedient. We, we have just the opposite problem. We're overflowing with sin and God has been very patient and he's been very merciful. And the, the major issue with the sin that we all struggle with is that sin is a transgression or sin is open rebellion. So in case you're thinking, well, maybe this message is really not relevant to where I am today. Maybe you're thinking that this message really is not relevant to where we are in history. I want to beg a differ with you, okay? And I want to share with you, first of all, the key verse, which would be Amos chapter 2, verse number 4. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, and even for four, I will not turn my back or my wrath, because they have rejected the law of the Lord, and have not kept my decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, and their gods, the, the gods of their ancestors that they had followed. So, so here Amos is setting the pace and setting the tone, and he's saying, listen, God doesn't want to bring about wrath upon you and judgment upon you, but it's got to that tipping point. He said, okay, that's really great, okay? He's real general, right? We, we all struggle with a heart of, of a rebel, right? Every single one of us struggle with that. But, but what makes it different with where Amos is, and, and why is it at that point where it's now become a, a tipping point? And, and the reason this is so relevant is because he gives us some signs or problems that he is dealing with within his culture that indicates they are at a tipping point. And so as we go through these problems, you're going to discover that they are very close, they parallel the problems that we face in our culture today. I'm not going to have all doom and gloom, but to go through a bad, some bad things at the beginning of the message, and then I want to kind of drive home the point, who is the person that God can use? And God can use just about anybody who is willing to do certain things. But before we get to that point, let's look at some of the problems that Amos faced during his time of prophecy. Num number one is that he faced terrorism, okay? Uh, we're not too far into the chapter. In verse number three of chapter number one, the Lord says, the people of Damascus have sinned again and again, and I will not forget it. I will not leave her unpunished anymore, for they have thrashed my people in Gilead as grain is thrashed with iron rods. Now, Damascus was the head of the metropolis of Syria. And Amos is looking out and he says, the reason God is so ticked off with us because we are living like terrorists. We are killing people in the most brutal fashion. Well, if that was just the only problem they had to worry about, uh, maybe it wouldn't be quite so severe. But as we get down to verse number six, we discover they also had a problem not with just terrorism, but with slavery or with human trafficking. For she sent my people, verse number six, into exile, selling them as slaves in Edom. Now, in case you think that slavery is a dead issue, here are the top 10 countries that battle slavery in the United States of America today. There are over 60,000 people involved in sex trafficking that we know of. That's what we know of. There's probably way more than that that we don't know about. But typical slavery as we think about it, in India, 14 million slaves. In China, 3 million slaves. In Pakistan, 2.1 million slaves. In Nigeria, where our dear pastor friend Bishop Friday serves. In Nigeria, there are 700,000 slaves. In Ethiopia, there are 650,000 slaves. In Russia, there's just over half a million slaves. In Thailand, there's just under a half a million slaves. And we could go on and on and on. Not to mention the trafficking of women, the trafficking of children, into commercial slave exploitation. You see, we have a major problem with slavery in our culture today as did Amos. We say, well, you know, we got terrorism, we got slavery. What else do we have? What other doom and gloom do we have, right? In verse number nine, we discover that Amos's people had trouble with breaking their promises. They would make a promise, 
and not keep that promise. It says in verse number 9, For they broke that treaty with their brother Israel. They attacked and conquered him and led him into slavery to Edom. Now throughout God's word, it says a lot about making promises and making covenants. As a matter of fact, Solomon, the wisest guy who ever lived, said this, When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you owe. It is better that you should not vow a vow than that you should vow a vow and not pay it. You say, well, pastor, I always keep my promises. I always keep my word. If I make a promise, I keep a promise. But then you are the exception because in 2015, in the United States, these United States of America, 819,240 people declared bankruptcy, according to the law book, or the law group, rather. You say, what's the big deal? Promises, promises, promises. Aren't we supposed to be promise makers and not worrying about being promise makers because life happens? Sometimes we agree to do something and then we can't do it. Uh, there's a domino effect with breaking promises. When we break a promise, it's a big word, right? If you break it, it will also lead to you breaking other words. One example would be trust. How can God trust us if we cannot keep our promises? And so God looked out at the nation of Israel and says, we've got a major problem here. Not only do we have slavery, not only do we have terrorism, not only do we have broken promises, but also we have murder as we get down to verse number 11. And we haven't even got out of chapter number 1, and we have four major indictments. This fourth one is murder. The Lord says, Edom has sinned again and again. So, so this is a recurring thing. This is not an isolated fit of rage where somebody killed somebody because they got so mad at them, they lost control and killed them. But this was going on again and again. He says, I'll not forget it. I'll not leave him unpunished anymore. For he has chased his brother Israel with a sword. And he was pitiless and unrelenting in anger. This is not a trick question, but a question that maybe you didn't think about. Since January 1, 2016, until 5.30 this morning, February 7th, anybody want to guess how many homicides were committed in these, the United States of America? Take a guess. You want to take a shot at it. If you'd say 500, you're way too low. If you'd say 1,000, you're way too low. If you'd say 1,500, you're getting closer. But since January 1st of 2016 until 5.30 this morning, this number may even have increased since 5.30 this morning, 1,714 people have been murdered in our nation. So I think that we have a little bit of a problem here. Well, you'd hope that Amos would kind of let up. I mean, this is starting to get deep. This is starting to get, uh, you know, depressing. We get down to chapter number 13, and we discover there's another problem that this nation has, and that is abortion. Oh, and we thought that was a modern problem that took place only in our nation and only in the last 30-some years. But no, we discover that abortion was a problem in the days of Amos. The Lord says, verse number 13, the people of Ammon, have sinned again and again, and I will not forget it. I will not leave them unpunished anymore. For in their wars in Gilead, to enlarge their borders, they committed cruel crimes, ripping open pregnant women with their swords. A another question. Since January 1, 2016, until February 7th, 2016, approximately 5.30 this morning, Anybody want to venture how many abortions were performed in the United States of America in the first five weeks of this year? If you thought 10,000 was somewhat close, you're not even close. If you thought maybe, well, maybe 40,000, then you're not even close. Let's double it. How about 80,000? And you're still quite a ways off. Well, how about 100,000? You still have a ways to go. In the first five weeks of this year, 111,408 babies were aborted. Wow. Do you understand the seriousness of why God thought his nation was at a tipping point? 
You see, we kind of have become calloused toward this because these are the same things that we face in our culture. Well, maybe we are trying to obey God's laws as a nation, and we just have a little bit of a weakness with a few things. As we get into chapter number two, we discover that Amos looks out and the Lord says that the people of Judah have sinned again and again. I'll not forget it. I'll not leave them unpunished anymore. Why? Because they have rejected God's laws, refusing to obey them. They have hardened their hearts and they have sinned as their fathers did. In other words, the Ten Commandments became ten suggestions, maybe ten opportunities for you, but they were not taken seriously. They rejected God's laws. And as a result of that, when you reject God's law, anarchy begins to ensue, injustice begins to follow, and we get down to verse number six and we discover that they also had a similar problem that we have in that the courts were corrupt. The Lord says, the people of Israel have sinned again and again, and I'll not forget it. I'll not leave them unpunished anymore, for they have perverted justice by accepting bribes and sold into slavery the poor who can't repay their debts. They trade them for a pair of shoes. I remember years ago hearing about a young man who was killed over a pair of Nikes. I heard of another man who was killed for a pair of Air Jordans. What? This was not a new phenomenon. Amos had the same problem. Perverted justice, corrupt courts. Is there any end to this doom and gloom? Well, we get down to verse number 8, and we discover that he had a problem with people stealing. And a man and his father defile the same temple girl, corrupting my holy name. That's referring to nasty things that were happening within a worship service at their religious fe feast. They lounge in clothing stolen from their debtors. In their own temple, they offer sacrifices of wine they purchased with stolen money. They were doing this crazy, they were stealing money to buy wine for the temple. Insane. Well, I think we still have a little problem with stealing in our nation and within our churches as well. Can we get a break from this? Man, I could have stayed home and had this doom and gloom news, right? Uh, well, we go down to verse number 12 of chapter number 2, and we discover not only were they living wrongly, but they wanted to silence religious views that were opposed to the way they were living. But you caused the Nazarites to sin. The Nazarites were the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. They would take this thing called the Nazarite vow. They would set themselves apart, much like the Levitic Levitical line, and they would really dedicate their lives to serving God within the temple. They lived a disciplined life. They lived a holy life. And so one of the things they agreed to is that they would not touch the dead. They would not cut their hair. They would not drink wine. And, and I would discover that the religious leaders are being urged to drink. And, and, and then they'd get up and they'd give a message. And they would say, this is the way of the Lord. And here's the problems that we have as a culture. And here's the sins that we have as a nature, nation. And they silenced the prophets, telling them to shut up. Paul repeats the same theme. When he urges young Timothy to be instant in season and out of season, because there's going to be a day when people want their ears tickled, and that day is now upon us. In Amos chapter 3, it says, Of the peoples of the earth, of all the peoples of the earth, there's hope. Here's the hope. I have chosen you alone. That is why. You ever wonder why it seems that the world is getting away with murder and you get caught for doing the minusculest, smallest little things and people are up in arms over that? Here we have the answer for why that is. You are a chosen people. That is why I must punish you the more for all of your sins. For how can we walk together with your sins between us? And in case you're thinking, well, that was the Old Testament. That has nothing to do with us. We're in a whole different dispensation. We are, you know, recipients of God's grace. This is how Peter put it in 2 Peter chapter 2. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
So the message is this, if we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and we have been set in a new direction, God is scouring the earth and says, I'm looking for some men and women who will not compromise my word, not in the way they live, nor in the way they speak, but they will follow through in obedience, and they will speak in defending the gospel. They will take some hits for defending the gospel, but they will be undeterred because the gospel has so radically changed them. Not only is their life looking forward to everlasting life, but they're looking forward to living this abundant life here on this earth. And so as a result, they are able to hold back the forces of evil. Do you know as a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit resides within you? And because the Holy Spirit resides with us, when we are walking in sync with the Spirit, and we're not grieving the Spirit, when we are walking in the Spirit, and Paul puts it like this, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he uses a contrast. Don't be drunk with wine, because the wine takes over but be filled or overflowed or drunk with the Holy Spirit. When a believer is living at that level, filled with the Holy Spirit, actually overflowing with the Holy Spirit, he brings great comfort to those who are also Spirit-filled. He brings great attraction to those who don't know Christ, but he also brings some anger to those who don't know Christ. So he must be ready for that. That's why we offer classes on spiritual warfare. Why Robin is offering this class the second time around. So that you will be equipped for the enemy when he attacks you. Because when you stand up for righteousness, you will be attacked. And sometimes you'll be attacked from those who are, quote unquote, religious leaders. You see, God wants you on his team. God is looking for you and he has a special position for you. And he wants to reveal some things to you because you're on his team. Amos 3.7 says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. I like how the New Living Translation translates that verse. But always, first of all, I warn you through my prophets, this I now have done. God is raising up Amos. Amos, you are a shepherd. Amos, you take care of sycamore trees, and you collect the fruit from the sycamore trees. But I see something different in the new Amos. I see that you have the making of one who can defend and speak on my behalf. Amos, we got a problem. We are at a tipping point. I need somebody who will speak the truth and speak it with passion. And not only speak it, but more importantly, live it. Amos, you're my man. You are going to be raised up as a prophet. I know you're not a son of a prophet. You don't feel like you're qualified for this position. But God is not looking so much for ability as he is looking for availability. Amos, are you available? Yes, sir. I will defend and proclaim the good news of the gospel. So we pause in between what is happening. And we stop and we think, why did God use Amos? You see, God doesn't work arbitrarily. God doesn't say, hmm, I wonder who could do this job and say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you got it. No, God is scouring the earth and he's saying, I'm looking for some men and women of deep and profound character who have been radically changed by me. I'm looking for those who not only have been radically changed by me, but have a solid character and a deep foundation in the truth who are undeterred by what happens within the culture, who will proclaim the good news. I've entitled the message, God Can Use Anybody, using the backdrop of Amos. And we're going to take from the life of Amos the character qualities that he had in order that God would use him. The first one we find is that he was completely interrupted to follow God's will. He was willing to do whatever God asked him to do. He didn't say, hey, I want to be a servant of Christ, but I don't do certain things. Uh, he didn't put any parameters on what he was willing to do. And I think this is where a lot of us miss the bigger blessing that God has for us. is because we kind of compartmentalize things and say, okay, God, this is my God life. This is my personal life. This is my financial life. You know, this is my fun life. And this is my, you know, family life. And, and God says, no, I want the whole, the whole enchilada. I don't want just a part of it. I want you to realize when I am calling you to do something, there's going to be interruptions in your life. 
But you've got to be like my son, who when he interrupted his time in heaven and he came down to identify with humanity, taking on the form of the servant, offering himself up as a sacrifice, the night before he's crucified, is in the garden and he's praying. And his prayer goes like this. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is praying to his Father. He says, I'd rather not do this. If there's a way around this, I'm going to take it. But not my will. Yours be done. Amos had to have some plans changed. When you get down to Luke, uh, Amos chapter 7, we're going to go back to this later on in the message. But Amos was able to confront Amaziah, a religious leader in his day. And he confronts him, and he says, you know what? I know you're thinking I'm a nobody. I'm just a shepherd. I'm just a farmer. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. But the Lord took me from tending the flock. The Lord was preparing him just like he prepared David of old. Paul Tripp in his book, Whiter Than Snow, on page 21, if you're interested in what page this came from, said this, You and I don't live in a series of big, dramatic moments. We don't careen from big decision to big decision. We all live in an endless series of little, small moments. The character of our life isn't set in ten big moments. The character of a life is set in 10,000 little moments of every day. It's the themes of struggle that emerge from these little moments that reveal what's really going on in our hearts. God looks down at Amos and says, you're my man. I've been watching you. You're willing to be interrupted to follow my will. I want you on my team. I know you're not the son of a prophet. You're not a prophet, but I want you on my team. The second characteristic that we see in Amos is that he was compassionately inspired by the Word. He didn't have selfish motives. He says that the Word of the Lord took me. Now in the Hebrew we miss, in the English we miss some of the intent of what he is saying. He says the Word of the Lord took me or, or compelled me. The, the literal translation of that is when he got a hold of the Word of the Lord. He married it. He, he embraced it. He took it literally. He seized it and hung on to it. He laid hold of it, embraced it like he would embrace his wife and say, till death do you part, I will love you and cherish you and, and honor you. That was the level of commitment that he had. The reason he had to have that level of commitment, because by the time we get to chapter number 8, we see where the nation was. There was a famine in the nation. Amos 8.11 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine throughout the land. Can I say this is where we are in the United States of America? If you look at some of the largest churches in our nation, there's not a thumble full of the Word of God presented it's happy, happy, happy. You're okay. I'm okay. Slap you on the back. Health, wealth, prosperity. That is where the majority of our nation is. It's a travesty. There's a famine of the land. Amos gets very specific. It's not that we don't have enough food. It's not that we don't have enough water. We have no desire for the word. And when it is not even proclaimed, because we don't have a diet within the Word of God, we don't even realize we are living on candy bars and junk food. And we're thinking we are getting the deeper things of the Word of God. We don't have an acquired taste for the Word of God. But if we are going to be used powerfully, we must be compassionately inspired by the Word, not compassionately driven by money or any other thing that would 
drift us along. His, pri- his driving force had to change. God says, hey, go prophesy. Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. He even gave him a few things to talk about in this prophecy. Number one, verse number one, this is what the Lord says. Gives him the illustration of locusts. We talked about that last week. And locusts coming in and swarming and devouring everything. And then talking about the judgment of fire. And talking about using a plumb line and saying, as God's people, use this plumb line, God's word, to see how they line up. That will be your message. Go and prophesy. There's another characteristic that we see in the life of Amos. Is that he was constantly informed by God's way, his way. You see, there is a tendency for all of us to begin to turn inward. To think that we've got this thing figured out. We know what we need to do because look what has happened in the past. And it's, it's so easy for us to turn inwardly and, and no longer being informed or inspired by His way. It's easy to become on autopilot where we're not diligently searching the Scriptures. Uh, we're kind of just going through because we know enough. Right? We know the basics of our faith. We know some of the fundamentals of our faith. But we're no longer really informed by the way God is moving. We're kind of going on secondhand blessings. Kind of going on what happened 20 years ago or, or 15 years ago or 10 years ago. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says that the Word of God is alive and active and it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. And it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. One of the reasons it's so difficult to get deep within the Word is because the Word deeply convicts us. It deeply cuts us. It's much easier to say it at a very superficial level in our understanding of God's Word. But if we really want to be used by God, our instructions manuals must change. John Maxwell said this, Great leaders have courage to fulfill God's vision And it comes from passion, not position. It comes from this burning passion to follow the ways of the Lord. Amos chapter 7 and verses 8 and 9 says, Then the Lord said to me, Look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. Hey, Amos, your job is to tell them this. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed And the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Wow. So if you want to really be used by God, and He can use anybody, we must constantly be informed by His way. Not just knowing what is happening within our culture, but more important, knowing where God is moving, what He is doing, and what He is about to do. Number four, we must be consistently intrigued by his truth. Not compromising his truth, being intrigued by his truth. When we drop down to verse 14 of chapter 7, then answered Amos, and he said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither the son of a prophet, but I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. He couldn't compromise on the message. You know, you may be in a position where God allows you to speak on his behalf. It is a great place to be. And you may be fearful. But Romans 8 tells us these powerful words. The Spirit himself helps our weaknesses. We don't even know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with groanings that are too deep for words. He searches our hearts and he knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I I don't know about you, but that intrigues me. That that, that God is praying. Jesus is praying on my behalf. And he's asking the Spirit to help me with my weaknesses. So when my back is up against the wall and I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do, I've got... Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and he is interceding on my behalf, and he says, Spirit of God, would you go help Calvin Corbett? He's kind of weak. He's kind of feeble. He needs an empowerment of your Holy Spirit. He can't do this on his own. 
He must be intrigued with what you're doing. Would you work in his behalf? Would you take up residence within him? Paul takes it even a step further. And he says, don't be drunk with wine where is the next success, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, that ongoing process of the Holy Spirit overflowing in my life. The sin has been overflowing long enough. Now it is time for the Spirit of God to overflow. So Amos had to have passions changed. You know, when the right passion is driving you, excuses for failure go out the window. When you are driven by selfish passions, when God asks you to do something of a spiritual nature, you will always find an excuse why you don't do it. Because you're driven by a selfish passion. But when God fills you with his right passion, failure is not an option. It's not on the radar. It's not even thought about. Because you are walking in sync with what God is doing. Now the reason this is so important is because Amos at this stage of the story needed a special empowerment. He's about to go up against Amaziah. Amaziah was a powerhouse of a religious leader. But he was not speaking the truth. He absorbed the culture and became just like his culture. It used to be that we respected the church and we felt that the church should be the one that is setting the agenda for what we believe within a culture. We no longer say that. Now we disagree with it. So what many churches have done is say we must accommodate the culture. We must avoid certain things. We must avoid certain sins. And our whole purpose in gathering together is to just pump everybody up, to slap everybody in the back, to encourage everybody. You will come in a sinner, and you will go out a sinner. But we will coddle you in your sin, because we really don't want to rock the boat. As long as you keep giving some money, we'll keep on telling you what you want to hear. We will keep tickling your ears. But as we look at what is happening here, the nation had got to a tipping point. The good old boy, I'm okay, you're okay, messages would no longer be able to cut it. They were at the point where God was about to unleash his wrath. And it even affected those who were the religious leaders. And so in Amos chapter 7, verse 17, Amos speaks up. Fear and trembling, I'm sure. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, Amaziah. Your wife will become a prostitute in the cities, and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. The land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will surely, surely go into exile away from their native land. And then we get down to verse number, or chapter number nine. Here is the hope of the message. I will bring my people Israel. Back from exile, they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. We saw this fulfilled in May of 1948 when Israel once again became a nation. The next time God deals on a global level with his wrath being outpoured is when he comes back to redeem us and take us from this place. But until then, God can use anybody who is willing to surrender to him. God may be wanting to use you to be a blessing to somebody who's going to turn the world around. You never know. In May of 1846, an evangelist, mostly forgotten by name, a guy by the name of James Coffey, visited a chapel in Northingham, England, and he preached a sermon. The words, part of them are recorded of the sermon that he preached. From St. Mark's Gospel. Therefore I say unto you, what things whoever you desire when you pray, believe that you shall receive them and you shall have them. 
Coffee preached that the key to this verse was to learn to desire God's desire and that God's foremost desire was that we develop the character of a servant to help the poor, to spread the gospel, that souls might be saved. A gangly young man was present at that service. He'd been saved two years prior, but had been drifting in his faith. But that day in May, God spoke to this gangly young man through the evangelist James Coffey. The Holy Spirit gave the young man a passion and a desire to be a servant. The young man acted on God's direction. He devoted himself to starting an organization committed to the salvation of souls and to the service of the needy. A sermon on desiring servanthood inspired this young, gangly William Booth to fulfill his destiny in the founding of the Salvation Army. You see, you don't know how God is going to use you if you're willing to stand in the gap. The message of Amos is a difficult message because he was living during difficult times. The message that we proclaim, the good news of Christ, is a difficult message because we are living in a counterculture to Christianity. We are living in a culture that no longer respects the message of Christ nor the teachings of Christ. But that doesn't mean we must back off. We must be ever more diligent to share the good news. Because when you get past all of the veneer of health, wealth, and prosperity, you discover that there's an awful lot of people who are hurting. Just this week, we had five people pray to receive Christ. People who were searching for answers. There was a willing vessel, a willing person who says, you know what? I'm going to speak. I will defend the gospel. I will share the truth. And these precious souls prayed to receive Christ. God puts us in a circle of influence. Some have larger circles of influences than others, but every one of us has a circle of influence. My question to you today is, will you stand in the gap? We get a little bit uncomfortable to be all that God wants you to be. There is somebody that is looking for a hope that lies within you. I've discovered the way God works is this. He will not allow a person to go to hell because I'm disobedient. But I will miss the blessing of being his funnel, of bringing the good news of the gospel to somebody if I'm living in disobedience. He will bypass me. He says, I would love to use you, Corbett, but I can't trust you. You don't keep covenants. You're stealing. You're disingenuous. You're lacking in character. You're not a vessel of honor. So, so I'm going to bypass you. And we're going to go to somebody else who you think is much less qualified, who doesn't have it together as much as you think he should have it together, and I'm going to use him. I'm going to use the foolish to confound the wise. D.L. Moody butchered the king's English every single time he preached. Every time he'd get up, the leader of the church says, can you work on that? He says, there's a fire in my bones, and I share the gospel. I am not well trained, and I'm not eloquent. One particular night, an English professor showed up. I'm going to go hear that guy, Moody. And I'm going to ridicule him the whole time he preaches. I'm going to lambast him when he gets out. I'm going to point to him all of the mistakes that he made grammatically and phonetically. I'm going to mock him when I, when I get done. The man listens to D.L. Moody comes under a deep conviction, repents of his sins, comes forward and accepts Christ. Listen, God has got somebody who wants to hear the message of Christ through you. Will you stand in the gap? Will you say, hey, you know what? I know these are tough times and, 
Everything in my being wants to go hibernate somewhere and hide somewhere. Just kind of go along to get along. I don't want to rock the boats. Can I be honest with you? That's a fight that every single one of us have. Every single one of us. But God's looking for one or two people who will say, you know what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek. I will proclaim the good news of Christ. It may cost me. It may cost me financially. It may cost me with my reputation. But my strength comes from the Lord. My provision comes from the Lord. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen God's seed begging for bread. God will take care of me if I'm obedient to him. So that's the challenge of the book of Amos. Do you want to just go along to get along, or do you want to make a profound impact spiritually on your family, on your neighborhood, in our church, and in our community? So I'm going to ask you to stand with every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask you to do something that may make you feel a bit uncomfortable, but maybe you are here this morning and you've listened to the message and you say, you know what? I've got somebody that I really know and I really love who doesn't know the gospel. And maybe the reason they don't know the gospel is because I've been too timid, I've been too fearful to share the gospel. And the truth of the matter of, of it is I haven't really had a whole lot of zeal and passion about sharing the gospel, but I want to change. I want my life to be interrupted. I want my agenda to be put on the back burner. I want to passionately follow God's way. I want to be intrigued by God's word. I want to have the passion to share the gospel with somebody that I know and I love. And I want to be made just a little bit uncomfortable to do so. If that is you this morning, I'm going to ask you to take a brave step and that is to just come forward. I'm not going to ask you to pray as you come forward. I'm going to pray with you, for, for you. But I'm just going to ask you to stand up here and say, you know what? I'm willing to get uncomfortable to defend the gospel. If that's you today, would you just come on up here and just stand up front? Just come on up here right this time and stand up front. Say, come on, right up here, right up front of the whole stage. Say, hey, you know what? Somebody I know and I love doesn't know Christ, and I want to stand in the gap for them. Man, I want to pray for them. I want to live my life in such a way that they see something different within me. You know, when Peter talks about the fact that we are to be able to give a defense of the hope that lies within us, the context of that is not when things are going well. It is when all hell has broken loose and the bottom of our lives has fallen apart and the world looks at us and they see hope in us and they ask us, where does that hope come from? And we can tell them, the hope does not come from me. The hope comes from Jesus Christ. I'm resting upon his rock. He is the one that has filled me with his spirit. He is the one that allows me to be surrounded in his love. So this morning, we want to have that power of God resting in our lives. So Lord, I pray for those who have come this morning. I thank you for the brave step that they have taken. I thank you for the opportunities that you're going to set before them. Because your word is very clear. You're going to reveal some things to them as they go ahead. You've placed the names of some people upon their hearts. I know some who are up here and they have family members who are lost. I know some who are up here who have friends who are lost. And so, Lord, I pray that you will use them to be your mouthpiece as they stand to defend the gospel. And as they get hit, Lord, would you allow them to have the strength of the Lord and the power of the Lord. May they be armored up with that spiritual armor. Above all, praying that you will fill them with the Spirit. Praying that you'll give them your wisdom so that they can be used to be a blessing to so, other, to so many others. And Lord, we're going to give you the glory and the honor for it. Bless these who have come this morning. In Jesus' most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And amen. Let's give them a round of applause for coming this morning. That is awesome. I know that was a big step to come, and uh, we appreciate you coming. We're going to pray for you throughout the week, and uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to come. Uh, you may be seated for just a moment. Ushers, if you'd come at this time uh, to receive the offering, and uh, thank you for being so generous and giving. Uh, we, we had a Sunday where we had bad weather, 
and the offering was really low that one Sunday, but thankfully you made it up last Sunday, and I certainly do appreciate you uh, giving on that Sunday where most of us couldn't make it to church. Uh, we had church, and uh, over 100 of you listened online that Sunday, uh, but I want to thank you for giving so generously, and uh, we uh, use that money to advance God's kingdom, and we say thank you. We do appreciate it. All right, Pastor Eric's going to sing us out. Let's all stand and sing Lighthouse. You have a great day. In the silence, you won't let go. In my questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea.